Hello, everyone. Thank you so much uh, for joining us this evening. A very warm welcome uh, to CCO's 19th fireside chat titled uh, The Difference a CCO Can Make to a Company. I'm Vignesh, Field Marketing Specialist at uh, Freshworks, and I will uh, take you through a quick round of introductions before we get started. So, uh, CCOF is a unique forum that is uh, creating India's largest uh, network of uh, customer service. Uh, and customer experience of professionals. And uh, this event, of, uh, which is CCOF's 19th Fireside Chat, is being brought to you in partnership with Freshbox. Uh, so welcome you all once again, and uh, it's time to welcome our guests uh, today. We have with us uh, Pradeep Ratnam, aka Paddy, as he's fondly known, who's the Chief Customer Officer at uh, Freshbox. Uh, in his role, he leads a global team of about uh, 400 CX employees who are responsible uh, for building deep uh, customer relationships, including the likes of HP, Cisco, Toshiba, Honda and American Express. Uh, he's a fierce customer advocate, serial entrepreneur founder uh, with uh, two successful acquisitions under his belt and a trusted board, board member as well. So uh, earlier in his career, he uh, founded Answer IQ, an AI fueled uh, customer service company, which was acquired by Freshbox in 2020. And uh, prior to this, he founded and led Aditi Technologies uh, through its uh, successful acquisition by uh, Symphony uh, Teleka. And uh, before his stint at Aditi, he spent over a decade at Microsoft as uh, general manager for its uh, ISV business. So he also serves as a mentor uh, in the local uh, you know, startup community in Seattle and uh, is a very active member of the Washington Technology Industry Association and uh, TIE Seattle. So welcome uh, to the session, Paddy. Uh, happy to have you here. Uh, on to our moderator for today. Uh, the man who we all know as MD, who is the founder of this forum. Uh, he's an alum of IIT Madras, Michigan State University, and Stanford Business School. Uh, he has been an industry veteran for 33 years and an entrepreneur for the last uh, 18 years. And uh, he was uh, the first managing director of Dell International Services and is one of the pioneers of uh, India's contact service uh, and contact center industry. Uh, uh, so currently, he's a mentor to many startups and a passionate CS, uh, CX advocate. Uh, welcome, MD. Uh, before I hand it over to the guests, I uh, have a few quick uh, tips to ensure you have a great experience. Uh, so I'm sure all of us are experts in Zoom meetings by now, but still a quick uh, call out. You can uh, submit your questions at any time during the uh, chat or whenever they're speaking in the Q&A box. And uh, all attendees have been muted to avoid any inadvertent uh, disturbance. So, um, and uh, post your questions only in the Q&A box and not in the chat box. So MD will be monitoring your questions and then uh, ask them during the Q&A breaks. Uh, so that's uh, it from my end. Over to you, Andy. Looking wow. Forward. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Vignesh, for that quick introduction. That's, that's great. And uh, Paddy, wonderful to have you. Uh, thank you for thank making you. the time. I know it's kind of early, early in the morning for you, but uh, thanks for getting up early and uh, joining us here. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Andy. It's a pleasure. Pleasure to be here. Yeah. So, so before we actually go into the role of a CCO, uh, Paddy, wanted to kind of, uh, you know, walk through a little bit of your career itself, because I thought, you know, some of the stuff you'll say will not only be uh, informative to our members, but, um, you know, also perhaps inspirational to them. So let's go back. I, I think I met you when, probably mid or late 90s, long, long time ago, you were at yes. Microsoft, and I remember you were heading the ISV business. Um, yes. And I was actually trying to sell some stuff to you, if I remember right. Okay, <laughs> sell some outsource support, if I remember, through to your ISV through you. Yeah. That's so, correct. so you know, how how did how did you find your place to how did you find your way to being an you know a leader of an ISV in a large company like Microsoft? Yeah. So a lot of you know, I think generally careers are very accidental. Uh, you know, unless you've chosen to you know, go down the path of, you know, taking a financial accounting path and go down, become a CPA, become eventually a CFO of a company, or, you know, you're, uh, you've, you're deep engineering and you want to build software. Most of the careers are, you know, very accidental. And I think there's a lot of experiential learning in early days. Uh, and Microsoft back then was one of the most amazing places you could work in. It was super entrepreneurial. Everybody operated their businesses like small businesses. And so I got a lot of experiences. And then the next issue, next thing was to really take risks, like always go on, take on something that I haven't done before. 
you know, so every two to three years, uh, you know, uh, once I started doing sales and I thought I was really good at it until I met really real salespeople. Then I went into marketing th thinking maybe I'm really good at this and, and learned a lot uh, with some amazing people I, I, I met and experienced. And then into business development, I learned amazing stuff about partnerships, business development channels. Uh, and then eventually decided to take the risk and say, hey, why don't I want, why don't I go and run a company now that I have some experiences? Then I realized how bad I was <laughs> at that too, uh, uh, until I could find some mentors and, and really like learn from those experiences. Well, in, in, interestingly, from a product company, you went to a services company to run it. I, I, yes. What, 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 uh, how did that, I mean, what was your thinking behind that? It was an interesting trigger point in my life. You know, I had spent over a decade, 12 years at Microsoft, and I was beginning to feel itchy about wanting to do something more entrepreneurial. And, you know, at that point of time, uh, I didn't realize, you know, that outsourced services was done. Uh, so, but I decided to go take a risk and say, uh, you know, there is still opportunity here in this space. Let me try and see if I can, you know, take this, take a business uh, like a DT and, and do something with it. And it was... Uh, you know, it was, you know, in some ways, super amazing experience because you know you had to like kind of reinvigorate, create a new brand, could uh, put a new proposition, differentiate in an extremely crowded marketplace, right? And, and then um, you know build a business out of it. So, you know, all those experiences counted because some of the things that you learn in large companies is about scale. So the things you learn in large companies is about operational excellence and how do you go about doing that time and again. Uh, and then as you come to a smaller place, it's really about execution, agility, uh, you know, doing it with fewer people, fewer resources, and trying to see the success of it. So, you know, having the best of both worlds actually makes you, makes your your career and experiences richer. And I think that, that that probably forms the foundation of most people's careers who are willing to switch around a little bit, uh, take some risks, you know, move between disciplines. Uh, and and really find their find their home, if you will. And and that's where you got the first, I guess, experience of a successful exit as well. Uh, that's and, right. And then and then straight into a startup. Yes. Yes. So it startup. was. <laughs> so <laughs> you know, one thing I didn't realize is I was trying to do a startup at the wrong age of my life, which is you know, uh, uh, my kids were almost out of the house. I said, hey, this is a good time to do a startup, but. You know, I, I, I was 47 at that point in time. It's like, what, what was I thinking? Because the energy that is required in the startup is like completely different. I wish I had done it in my, you know, early 30s, you know, with, you know or mid 30s where I was like having the right, had the right experiences and I jumped into it. But I was really fascinated with AI ML. Uh, you know, I'd been doing a bunch of interesting things like that at Aditi and Harman on, on at large scale and then decided like, hey, this could be an interesting space where customer service automation is going to get uh, disrupted. Uh, customer service will get disrupted because of automation and you know the millennials will never ever pick up the phone and call. Uh, and so there's going to be some interesting ways by which you know automation can be delivered. So I built this startup, I raised a series A, uh, then went down, went down the path, you know, grew the business. And as I was looking to get to the series B, uh, I met this interesting gentleman, Girish, uh, who has built an amazing company called Freshworks and said, why don't you come and, you know, partner with us? And, you know, we, I think there could be a really symbiotic relationship where your technology could be used by us and you could come and, uh, you know, work and do something interesting in, in Freshworks. So here I am, a year and a half in the pandemic, uh, basically came in, got onboarded, built, you know, got to know. And so we built like now, now a close to 800 person organization. Uh, you know, which basically encompasses everything from, you know, customers onboarding and professional services, customer success, customer service and support, and then a customer experience strategy. Because a big part of what I'm also trying to do here is really change all the touch points so we can reduce the friction in the way we can engage with customers. So, so and, yeah. uh, you know, it's been a fabulous ride, enjoying it. And so uh, here I am. Absolutely. And and again, if I remember right, uh, when, when you when you join John Hands with Freshworks, there wasn't that big a US presence. I mean, like you mentioned, you've just now built up 800 odd people. At the time, there wasn't. And then obviously you joined the senior management team of Freshworks and took on the title of CCO, not something else, not like country head or whatever, country director. You know, you, you 
took on a role of CCO. So what was the thinking behind that? Well, it's a, it's a relatively new title, right? As you can understand that, you know, uh, nobody- I, I nobody have a follow-up question be. on the title itself. <laughs> I have a follow-up question on the title itself, but carry on. <laughs> yeah, so it's a relatively new title. Uh, it's, it's still trying to find its, uh, it's got this ex existential crisis in the sense like, hey, where do you spit? You know, are you really focused on revenue? Are you focused on, on retention? Uh, you know, are you a cost center? And so that constant battle, of, you know, anybody who's in the customer service world or customer experience world is like your cost center. The CFO is always trying to clamp down on like, hey, what do you do here? But reality is, uh, I think that is a, it's a very critical role, right? And so the idea behind net revenue retention, you know, net dollar retention, and really thinking, you know, nobody is going to upsell by calling on a new customer or cross sell because you know hey it's a sales motion it is because your existing engagements are better it is because you are able to delight the customer it is because you built these amazing relationships and so i think having people understand that hey the foundation of a business is around the customer and the more customer centric we are and how we serve them will only enable us to improve our you know net promoter score improve our brand loyalty and, you know, I think the direct or end indirect result of that would be growth in revenue, right? And it's five times more expensive to acquire a new customer than serve an existing customer. So, so educating and really bringing the whole community of CCOs around the world is really a big part of what I, I wish to do, which is, you know, hey, uh, if you ask me, like, you know, did I regress in my career from a CEO to CCO? Uh, you know, it's not like that. I think there's some great learning experiences. Um, there's also amazing uh, you know, uh, things that are happening in both in terms of technology as well as how you can serve customers uh, without the traditional path of saying, hey, I will put this kind of ratios, those kinds of SLAs to really solve problems. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's interesting because you, you know, this is a CCO forum by the way, Chief Customer Officer Forum, but yeah. uh, you know, just a handful of people have the title of CCO by the way. In India, mm -hmm. and I'm pretty sure in the US as well, just a handful, a few companies have the you know, role of the CCO. Why, why do you think so? Do CEOs not think about CCO as a role? What, what do you think is the it's mindset a, behind? I think the mindset for most CEOs is really around two aspects of this, right? One is they are, and this was true of me as well when I was the CEO, which is you gravitate naturally towards revenue and growth. Course. You grad gravitate naturally towards product and engineering, right? And all other functions kind of tend to be, uh, you know, sort of cost centers, serve the customers and supporting, right? Uh, and so while this is a function that is emerging and it is, I think, over time going to become very paramount to the success of a business is because the skill sets are unique. Like, like I said before, like none of us got into this because we were, you know, we thought we'd get grow up and become a CCO at some point of time. I think the genesis of this, of, this, of this role really comes from the fact that you're really exceptional with managing, engaging, understanding customers. Um, and I think the importance of how this role is coming about is because you're able to get signals you know, about how the experience the customer has with your product, your services, your organization, and how do you really improve that? Because that is your long-term competitive differentiation. You know, in a, unless you're in a in a you know zero to one, you know, you create this the next Tesla, the Blue Origin space, whatever. Most businesses are you know incremental businesses, and you know you compete right. in reasonable, reasonably competitive markets. And so the idea behind what will differentiate a company from its competitors is really about the ability of a CCO to extract the, you know, the learnings, the insights um, in a way that you can present it back uh, you know, into the leadership team to where people can take actions from those insights, right? whether it's product, whether it's services, whether it's sales, you know, a lot of those things are right in front of us. Right? And so it's really is a mindset and that mindset is going to change this is going to become a critical role. This is not going to be one of those roles where people look at this and say, hey, you know, where do I stuff this role? <laughs> where, yeah, you know, yeah, yes, yeah. this is an important role. Uh, by the way, I struggle with it as well. You know, so if you were to meet a, you know, the elevator pitch they talk about, right? If you were to meet a CEO in an elevator, mm -hmm. how, how, 
how do you actually communicate the importance of a CCO role to a CEO saying you need that more than anybody else, more than anything else? How, how would you convince the guy? So I, I basically say a couple of things. The first thing is, you know, a, the core to a business is the customer, right? Acquisition is, is one part, which is a specialized skill that you know people in sales and marketing can essentially go out and get. But what you do to engage, retain, grow, and nurture for creating a customer for life is what a core business is all about. You know, businesses that last the test of time essentially are the ones that have the best experience, that have the best learnings that come from, from a individual, an entity that is able to garner data insights from how you engage customers and use that to its advantage, to its competitive advantage, right? And often, yeah. I think a lot of this role tends to end up becoming, you know, very sur, sur, you know, in, in a servile fashion, just like, hey, your customer service, you know, so it means goalkeeper, like, you know, hey, people are going to shoot darts at you, you just decide which, which ball to pluck. If your if you're customer success, it's really about, you know, serving the customer in, in a way that they don't, they don't leave or churn, right? But if you turn this around and you really start looking for signals, you start looking for so the elevator so to come back to the elevator pitch the elevator pitch is the customer is the center the people who understand exactly how the customers are using your product or service give you the strategic insights that can help you shape the direction so that your business can stay for 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 longest duration of time is what will make a cco role successful right and if you start thinking of it as a support function you're always going to be thinking about this as defense, which is to say, hey, yeah. I have this, this will help protect my base versus thinking about this is my asset, right? The existing customer is the single biggest asset a business has. And a lot of CEOs really don't realize, realize that that's what, that's what will make the difference between uh, you know, a company that really is wildly successful versus not. Yeah, which which makes all the more important in today's businesses, which are more SaaS oriented, right? Where you know you're not selling something and then vanishing and collecting a fifteen totally. percent maintenance. You you need to make sure they renew a hundred percent every year, or every month, yes. whatever whatever the model is, right? Yes. That that yes. that perhaps probably you know tilts the argument a little more to the CCO side. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So so is is this a role which which should always report to the CEO? Um, I, I think there's, there's multiple models to this, right? Um, in my mind, it should report to the CEO, uh, provided you have the right person who runs that in a strategic fashion, right? Uh, because it's, you know, in a lot of these things, a lot of these roles like chief digital officer, or chief experience officer, they're like transient in a lot of ways, right? But this one is here to stay, uh, provided you find the right you know, profile, you find the right person who can really bring, bring together, you know, the assets of the customer and demonstrate that to the leadership team in ways that you haven't seen before, right? Uh, let me give you a few examples, right? What signals do you get from customer service? You know, usually you see customer service in terms of what's the resolution time? You know, what's the average handle time? What's the CSAT? What's the NPS really? But what's more important is really not those things. You know, when you turn around and say, hey, here are the areas, when you start looking at things like effort score, here are the top five areas where the customer effort score is the highest, which basically means that those are fundamentally fundamental areas where you are under threat from your competition, right? You start looking at signals from, from support tickets, you know, of interactions and see, what is the chatter that customers are saying about us? What are they saying about us in these conversations? What are, what is it? And how do you really distill this in a way, way that becomes a little bit more interesting and strategic, right? Uh, on the success side, really like, you know, you start looking at this and saying, it's really not about having a great relationship and doing a high five, or taking the customer out for a beer, right? Because everybody tends to think like, hey, customer success is about, you know, let's go do Kumbaya with the customer and really like all go celebrate and, you know, things would be yeah. good. That was the old IBM way of selling, right? Yeah, yeah, I know. <laughs> Today's world is really about understanding insights from usage of product, 
you know, how advanced are they using it? Are they looking at cohorts of data from machine learning by understanding which customers stay and what did they use? Which customers stayed the longest? Which customers paid the highest? And why did they do that? And it was based in, those are the types of inferences that you need to really distill. And really understanding that is key, right? And it's at a very fundamental level, I think the most strategic, you know, customer leaders actually do are very good at segmentation because traditionally companies think of segmentation in their own fashion, which is to say, hey, I'm going to make this, you know, small, mid, large. I'm going to make this commercial enterprise, super commercial, like all of these labels and titles, right? Um, or I'm going to take this a revenue cut of this. I'm going to take, and then I think the idea really is like, when you understand who are your best customers, what is your ICP of a customer that has the highest growth potential? And so, you know, in your in your basket of customers, being able to understand this still segment in a way that you know how to manage your customers uh, in, in a most efficient manner, right? Which is really you can't you can't afford to serve everybody with like high touch resources. So, what kind of strategies do you build, right? Uh, and that's based on like what kind of segmentation you do. So, it's really around if you ask me. Data and analytics are going to the, be the core of a success in a, in, a, in a CCO's role. What you understand from, uh, you know, how usage of your product or service, what you understand from, uh, you know, interactions that, you know, customers are having with different parts of your organization, with these professional services and customer support or what have you. And then really bringing it all together with a strategy that says, how do you reduce the friction? How do you make it really friction-free? In, in, in a way in which customers can work with you and become their best advocates. Because if you did all this, then I think your NPS would be great, right? Your NPS would be great. You know, the, the network effect of your business would be great. And so I do think that these are some of the fundamentals of what will make a CCO succeed. And in my, in my view, that is a very strategic role in the company. And it's something that, you know, uh, uh, as a CEO, I know now, uh, that you know that you know having this role would make it very very effective if you if you had the right data and insights that you could make make decisions from there's another element also right i mean once the data firstly you know providing the leadership because data is there mm -hmm. and especially in this yeah. kind of a environment there's just too much data right i mean you'll have reams and reams yeah. of data yeah, 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 yeah. and so yeah. defining the problem and defining priorities to pull out the data is one part of it which you articulated yeah. very nicely but what about the mechanics of bringing about change? Because change is going to happen through your product team, through your engineering team, through your marketing, and so on. So what's the role you play around the, what do you call it, an exec table? The, you know, the, the CEO yeah. team, really. How does that work? And how do you manage the dynamics of it? I mean, I, you're still a small company, but I'm just extrapolating it for some of the CCOs in our group who are in much, much larger companies. Yeah, I think first off, it's a par partnership mentality, right? Mm. Uh, every organization, large or small, you know, um, it takes time to make changes, right? Uh, it, you also need to have a good sense of how to get organizational buy-in, right? Uh, you can't brute force anything. You got, while you have data and insights to show, but you have to have, a, you know, you have to be articulate in, in the way you actually go out and, present the story for, for driving a change, right? Whether it's a new feature request that you want in a product or whether it's fixing an existing bug which requires a higher priority or is changing the way you engage with the customer from your sales and account management teams, right? All of these are like fundamental changes that you need, like the kind of contracting or what have you, right? And so being on that table is, requires you to have a strong partnership framework, right? And that partnership framework is one which really is around partly SLAs, but really around building that relationship framework to understand the actions that we take from here can actually help us become better as a company. The actions we take here can help us improve revenue and satisfaction with our customers. And so um, that is a that is a that is a you know that requires experiences, that requires uh, you know relationship skills, that requires uh, you know. So that's why I said you know leadership is important in that role. You know, uh, being a good manager is 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 good enough, but it's not it's not yeah. great enough for you to get you on the exact table to have a voice on the table if you will. 
you know what the, the profile you're describing of a CCO is like, you know, you need to be 10 out of 10 in every, every facet you can think oh, no, of. No, no, <laughs> no. No, no, seriously, no, no. I mean, it is. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, but I would think that it's closer to the truth, really, because you need to bring change. I mean, look, you know the number of companies who say, you know, customers are important to us and, you know, we are customer centric. Mm -hmm. It's easy to say, but very difficult to, to kind of implement and act on it, right? And, uh, you know, that's... <laughs> so when you... So it's it's to do with the culture as well, right? Within companies, I think you know the mm -hmm. culture, perhaps set by the founders and by the CEO, and the culture which is set, which is partnership oriented, is a is a kind of a key ingredient, I would suppose. Absolutely, absolutely. I think you know um, management teams that are at loggerheads with each other, uh, or there is you know implicit friction of some kind, end up you know, creating silos of organizations, which are essentially to prevent each other from working with each other, right? And I've seen this in, in several organizations where, uh, you know, they'll build their walls and it's all, you know, it can get very passive aggressive about, we'll do this, we'll do that. Uh, good leaders, good CEOs and founders, they actually bring teams together at very fundamental ways, right? Uh, and I think bringing, keeping the customer at the center of it is, 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 is are, are the ones where the customer are the CEOs that win the best, the founders that win the best, the businesses that do the best, right? And easier said than done. Easier yeah. said than done because, you know, you have, you know, I think it all comes from where you are. I mean, if you come from a strong product mindset, you tend to take the product leaning. If you come from a strong sales and marketing mindset, you take a revenue leaning, right? If you come from a strong operational mindset, like a CEO, you basically take a very strong cost, cost based leaning to run yeah. efficient. And so the risks that you take, you know, and how you operate really depends on your core DNA, right? right. <laughs> so, absolutely. Uh, absolutely. <laughs> and so, so it's really about thinking about that and understanding your blind spots and saying like, hey, can I surround myself with people who can bring the skill sets that make me better? Can I surround myself with people who will educate and teach me from their experiences rather than you know, me going out and saying like, I can go and get this done myself, if you will, or go do this, right? Yeah, yeah, it, it's amazing actually, and and culture, culture, everything, everything is around yeah. culture. You, you did talk about a little bit about customer segmentation at some point, and so when you put together an organization, I I, I know uh, Freshworks is a company. You you sell your products across different geographies. So how do you organize yourself for that? Because you can't quite treat each geography as a separate segment, or or should you? And how do you actually organize yourself so that you can still be customer centric? yet be different to different geographies? Uh, well, I think for us as well, it's an evolution. It's a work in progress. I, I think segmentation by default is a work in progress for most companies. Uh, you know, it's easier said than done to say like, hey, let's go geo-based, let's go employee size based, you know, um, and, you know, we've taken two approaches, right? One approach is in the way we work with acquiring customers, we go by small, small, medium, enterprise, right, in, in some ways. Um, the way we engage customers is based on their book of business that they give us because yeah. you want to protect the book of business first uh, and really understand, hey, can you ensure that you have coverage for X percentage of your revenue? In our case, it's close to 80% of our revenue where we have a customer success person that's associated with the customer, right? 70 to 80% of our revenue. And so we've taken that. And then the next iteration of this is going to be more around, you know, growth and industry segments. And, uh, you know, the most sophisticated companies at the top really have become super verticalized. And then within that vertical, they have been able to like understand how to do the segmentation. But for companies that operate in broad horizontal markets, I think it's, it's important that you go through that evolution and understand which is your ideal customer profile. And then how do you really manage customers in that. And because you know, there are several overlays, there's an overlay of geo, right? There's an overlay of segment by employee size. And then you've got to really figure out like, you know, who are all, and, and since it's an art, you know, since it's a skill which requires you to have like amazing collaboration skills, because you've got to work with, you know, you know, different people, all product leaders, you've got to work with yeah. field leaders, you've got to work with account leaders and, and really bring a, a holistic view of the customer that's why I feel like that segmentation piece is an important piece. And it's, it, you know, there are, 
one needs to constantly be looking at their customer base because sometimes you may be protecting your best revenue that is historic revenue but not the future revenue right and so do you really pivot towards you know the the net, the new product revenue which is the highest growth engine or do you pivot towards just maintaining the core of your existing revenue and you put most of your best resources so the way to think about this is do you bet put your best behind your biggest problem or your biggest opportunity right <laughs> and so right, right. even That's under, a very well even very under, good way to put it yeah and even understanding that uh, requires you know uh, a little bit of more strategic analysis and thinking about uh, about the dynamics is this customer base growing or is it flat is there anything more to you know that we that we can sell up sellers is just purely a satisfaction play and then comes like hey should be how do we reduce the cost of service in this segment versus another segment so those are the types of questions you would ask as you do your segmentation sure so this is great i mean fantastic way uh, paddy you have explained the role of a cco now let's come to the team which you build actually because there is a front line there's a front line be customer service or customer success there's a front line which is dealing with your customers day in day out what skills do you look for or what different skills do you bring in to make make the cco successful i mean you being the leader of that team how do you what's the what's the skill you bring to them the front line um which which you think will help you so so first is your leadership team right building a strong solid some foundation of a leadership team um and the composition of the team is very important uh, if you get more people who look and feel like you with the same skill set you in some ways really have do not have that best growth mindset of learning right and so really start before even before you start you put the landscape out to saying what functions am i managing and what skill sets am i looking for the functions that i manage and so if you if you start by saying hey i have a professional services head you know what skill sets do i look for in that professional services head who has a strong operational mindset who has a strong you know business development orientation who has a strong you know foundation towards the future of 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 the next generation services that that are that are in play and how do you really evolve to those business models it's a it's a combination of those three and then depending on the type of product business what you are you'll say hey this is the skill set i need for this kind of a leader because then that's the foundation right same for customer success you know you look at your organization your product your evolution say so said you know what is you know is your product first gen second gen third gen in terms of like maturity and the initial stages you need to increase your customer success you know uh head count to really understand product usage and also field some of those hard questions that the customers have and then over time you see that hey the product becomes more mature there's more self help knowledge learning that you yeah. basically can say and so there are things like that you do and then you understand you know do we need more strategic relationships to in in this in this leader who can engage with customers at the executive level versus someone who's really operationally brilliant or someone who is like technically brilliant because the product tends to be a little bit more technical so it's nuanced i think the ability to understand the skill set first of the leadership team is very very important then comes the skill of like what is it for each role you know for customer service what kind of people do you really look for right and i think beneath that foundation is a very very strong layer of analytical mindset which is do you have a strong foundation of data data led practices that you bring to the organization which is really analyzing the core of you know whether it's you know churn or retention or upsell or or usage and usage analytics is it's just that mindset and the and the dashboard you put together that really tells you you know what are the top five things that really can make sure that your role is successful right because the expectations are different the expectations yeah. are really around like hey do we serve our customers well do they have great satisfaction do we have great relationships do we have strong advocacy and brand loyalty right you know and what are you know to, tomorrow if we build a new product if we need to build a new service you know will they all buy will they all love us right and you ask those questions and you say like hey what's the foundation of a cco role 
I actually think that you know it is the core that really brings and glues, brings the glue to all, all our customer relationships. And so building that foundation of a leadership team and then looking at the DNA and the skill set based on the maturity of the product or service that uh, is, is super important uh, in, 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 in how you build that team. Right. And it's an evolution in process. It's a constant of state of evolution, right? Because, uh, you know, you you have a team and then you invest in some skills. And, you know, sometimes when you invest in skills with people, they they really are able to like blossom and, and scale. In other cases, you will find that, you know, hey, they find themselves short and they're looking. For, and unless you bring in new talent and bringing in new talent is super important. right? And the diversity of talent really helps improve. Uh, like I said up front, which is like if you bring more people who have skill sets that are complementary to you and find the right composition of that team and build that culture of debate, uh, you will have a phenomenal organization. Yeah, very, very in interesting, important point I thought you made, which is you know the the data skills, the data analytical skills needs to be as deep as possible yeah. within the organization. Uh, we got a couple yes. of questions, Paddy, uh, from the audience. Yeah. I'm going to read this out. Yeah. This is from Andrew. If CEOs gravitate naturally to revenue and key functions is that a function of focusing on targets, revenue, et cetera, in the short term, while customer centricity is about profitability and sustainability. Oh, sorry, I didn't read this right. Okay, let me try again. If CEOs gravitate naturally to revenue and key functions, is that a function of focusing on targets in the short term, while customer centricity is about profitability and sustainability hand in hand for the long term? You know, I, the, the power of influence is key, right? If you have, then the reason why I'm using that is uh, revenue is always going to be important. Revenue should be on the eyeball of every CCO too, right? Because if you don't have, if you just have a cost mindset and a serve, serve mindset, uh, you lose the understanding of, of, you know, what is the larger picture? Because, you know, customers in every business, there is attrition in customers. There's also growth, right? And seeing that 360 degree view for a chief customer officer is very, very key, right? The second part of this is while there is a revenue conversation, there are enough ways for you to contribute to understand if you understand your segmentation, which customers and which cohorts have the best propensity to buy, right? Sure. Uh, you know, like we use a lot of machine learning techniques now to really try and understand, you know, how should we look at our customer data set to understand based on usage, the people, number of people who have one one product versus multi-product. Why do which customers take multi-product? What's their behavior, right? And really trying deep into it. that's why I said like a data mindset is key, uh, and because you now can have a seat at the table and say these customers have the highest propensity to buy based on what I understand, right? But the power of influence to bring that conversation along with the fact that hey. If we did this, you know, 80 to 90% of our revenue for the next year is secure, right? Mm -hmm. because, of, because of the book of business that you manage and how you manage that and how you can see the visibility for the next year is a part that needs to come. And so that's why I'm saying like the skill set does require go beyond serve and cost and yeah. operational mindset to a, a little bit around what's the, you know, what's the conversation I can have around be comfortable with the commercial conversation. If you're not commercially, if you're not comfortable with the commercial conversation, this role is a service role, right? Yeah. And so that's the that's that's a, that's a skill set that I, I would highly advocate that you know, and it can be it's it's learned. It's not you don't have to be, a, you know, a blatant out you know uh, used car salesperson type of mentality to go and sell. It's really about the engagement and the way you make that ask, right? Uh, and right. the best, if you have a relationship, it's easy. It'll come to you naturally. It'll, the big customers will come to you and say, hey, I really like doing business. People do business with business people, right? It's not that yeah. they do people business with organizations. And so the mindset that you already have a CCO who has great relationships, great framework of engaging customers now, can you go push yourself a little bit to be a part of making a very subtle ask, right? And I think that's an important attribute that a lot of CCOs struggle with. Yeah, and just CCOs, and I, I know that you can perhaps get a CCO because it's one person role such as yourself, but I think getting it to the front lines, getting it at scale within the organization is, I suppose, the most you know, challenging part. But that said, 
given your kind of business and actually most software businesses these days which are saas based i mean it's mm-hmm. right there right as i said you know within a year the customer has to renew or not renew you know so so uh, you know that that's 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 there the results are there to show uh, another yeah. question uh, paddy uh, this is from sundar hi paddy how long does it typically take a new cco to understand the problem statements in a new saas company and start working backwards slash how was your experience at freshworks on this one this is a very specific question <laughs> Well, I think for me it was a three to four month exercise. Three months of just um, just the first ninety days is about learning. Just sit down, learn, uh, and just analyze. Just keep asking questions. There is no such thing as a bad question. And the more you ask the question, what are we doing? Why are we doing? And how can we do this differently? Right. And without asking the question, how can we do this differently? If you just absorb and understand. you know how you currently operate with your customers and then just be brutal about reading every feedback form you know read through nps data read through customer satisfaction data right the best signals lie there about uh, it's not about the happy customers it's about the you know the customers who are complaining and then more importantly the silent detractors those are the ones that worry me the most right which is I don't have engagement with 25% of my customers and they are the ones who may potentially leave without even talking to you right and so right. really being able to look at that data from all of your customer sets and understand exactly how you operate how you engage and what is it that you have learned from from all of the feedback because first off do you have enough ways to capture feedback you know nowadays there's 360 nps across different touch points across different moments of moments of wow in a, in a, you know so you know people do like nps and csat just at the point of a qbr when everybody's like high flying each other's like hey fantastic we did a great job the reality is it's going to be high <laughs> at that yeah. point of time it is going to be high and that is not the right indicator the indicator is over the lifetime of a customer right indicator is at different points of of engagement done in in a in a more structured fashion rather than this way so i do feel that you know this is this is a this is all, all that is required is to really look at the data first and then make your opinions about how you for us for me it was a 3 to 4 month exercise with a lot of data on segmentation engagement engagement models and then coming up with uh, you know just a strategic plan saying hey in order to do this right uh, we need x million dollars and go to the you know go to the leadership team go to the board and make the ask you know and so uh you ought to be able to be ambitious bold uh, in your asks and if you don't uh well you can continue to you know just stay and say hey i i'm not getting enough resources i'm not getting visibility and what have you so you got to start thinking about the today and tomorrow and the picture of tomorrow ought to be bright and clear and straight in front of you that you can use the power of articulation and influence to bring everybody together on the table and say we want to be there and once everybody agrees to be there then uh investment's not the issue the real issue is then like saying how do you build this team and then execute which is the hard part <laughs> sure sure absolutely absolutely you did touch upon nps and you know csat and so on but you know in today's world uh, uh paddy isn't there so much survey fatigue i mean it's you need to be seriously motivated to fill out a survey whatever it may be whether you're happy or unhappy maybe you you are motivated when you're unhappy more than more often than not yeah so and we i think there's, there's a lot i mean i i learned from you too right which is hey just have a four point scale right either you have, you know you ask one or two questions simple questions one question reduce the effort for the customer but you got to capture the feedback because if someone give you a one on two versus one or two versus three or four you ought to quickly know something is off can you tell me, right and then what programs do you have that actually really touches back to the customer when they give you the one or two to say i'm i'm sorry you felt like that is there something that we can do what was broken right and it's a sort of fix understanding that and i do think that every company knows if you ask me every company knows exactly which areas are broken you don't need rocket science you just talk to the people on the ground and so one of the things that i do is i would do fireside chats with the employees who are actually at the ground and just like get to know them a little bit and then tell me exactly what are you hearing from customers 
right what right. are they telling you right what 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 do they not like about us what do they like about us right and you know that feedback is so valuable because it's hard to get that feedback from service right and so really being able to use this data back uh, in in more meaningful ways will actually get you access access to understanding like like i said and you know if you're running this you know exactly where the problems are uh, you can hear it in the noise of the people you can hear it in the in the surveys in some extent and then the question is really like how you hone in and, and deep to that but but having those those points and signals coming in are key if you don't have all of those signals coming in you're going to be oblivious to looking going a once in six months csat once in six months nps oh, yeah. and you know you just look at this data and you glean through it you do a lot of analysis but really and that's that's the old way of doing things if you will yeah 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 absolutely so i mean again coming back to the role of the cco paddy i mean yeah. the way in which you've defined a cco there's really nothing more to add to actually be a ceo of a company is there well i think it's a it's a path uh, yeah. and uh, uh, it's a, it's a question of aspiration it's a question of mm-hmm. desire and and risk taking right um, yeah. i do think that you do require uh, more skill sets than just that right because uh you know good ceos typically have been deep on product or service you know on one side been deep on revenue and understanding you know growth and acquisition and then you know there is the foundation of of the customer right so being able to and then then this financial management skills that you require yeah. so i think being able to have a well rounded perspective across those is key and so yeah. uh you know make the take the risk shift around right shift around a little bit right you know take on projects cross group projects that give you visibility to uh you know uh pnls in a more strategic way you know make sure your you understand your pnl and how you manage that well from a you know from a growth and risk perspective you know take on some revenue risk sometimes right uh, because yeah, yeah. if you don't uh, you will never really understand what it means to what take that to run risk, a business right? yeah, because yeah, yeah. yeah people tend to think of ccos as as a low risk profile right I and know. if you think Keep of it as a low risk everything <laughs> quiet <laughs> yeah if you think of yourself as a low risk profile uh, i think that transition to the next step is not in your path because you don't desire it right and so if you have if you desire i think there's clearly a path for from cco to yeah. ceo it's interesting there's a question here maybe you have already answered it but you can add if you wish can a seasoned cio i suppose chief uh, what information officer right cio look at becoming mm-hmm. a cco after all she or he has the best view of customer probably any suggestions on attributes or acquired knowledge as a career move so obviously there's a cio on this uh, you know who is listening in over here sure um you know i think cios have a uh, amazing perspective on on technology usage of technology inside the company uh, but tend to have like two faces that they that there are two pers- personas that they kind of interact with one is internal facing employees right uh, hr finance marketing sales they're all in you know it's it's a tough job because uh, you know you're always getting slack you know slacked on this is not working that is not working on one end on the other end the C- ceo is basically saying our it budget is 100 billion we got to take that down by 20% year on year get year on year efficiency so it's a tough role in that sense and the other is you you interact with with vendors right and on projects and like projects and say like hey these projects and these projects are behind schedule right that's typically the story <laughs> these projects are over there's, there's, there's a long <laughs> there's a long queue of projects all the time <laughs> yeah. yeah projects are behind schedule projects are over cost um uh, but i think if you have a a a desire and if you have that customer facing persona right i think the most important thing is you really want to ought to feel like i really engage, love engaging with customers i love interacting learning those experiences give me energy and give me positivity in the way i can i can operate in my life and if you are that type then the cco role is certainly one that i would say you can move to um, but again uh, i won't take away any of the other things which is you know the, the influence skills the relationship skills are super important as a cio you always you already have that you know and, and so i think uh, you know move, making the transition really is around what is your understanding of your customer what is your customer centricity 
do you really enjoy and you know are you passionate about the customer and if that, if that is true then i think making that switch is uh, is very much on the cards yeah and you. the other important <laughs> yeah, yeah, thank, thank you thank you uh, the the other thing also is the culture within the company we talked about culture earlier as well of enabling people to move across functions i think that's also an important but otherwise they would want to go we have to go to another company that's perhaps. True. so you know that's, that's the that's the other part here some more questions coming up chief business officer cbo is another new emerging role thank you i didn't know that how is this different from cco do you know anything about cbo <laughs> i think it's <laughs> Yes, yeah. probably more like a chief revenue officer uh, is what I would think, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, so, yeah, yeah. you know, it's just basically, you know, they may already have a chief revenue officer in some cases and they said, all right, let's create another role. But reality is, you know, uh, there's, uh, it's it's not a role that I'm very familiar with, so I should comment. Yeah, yeah. It must be, it must be the same of uh, CRO as yeah. you mentioned. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's fine. Well, we'll take one last question from the um, audience. There's one question here and then I have, one final question for you. Okay, um, so ML, AI, RPA, RPA is what? Robotic process automation, process automation, robotics, deep learning. This is not an overtly serious question, but an honest one. You know, with a caveat, the question is being asked, how confusing and interchangeably used are these terms? Okay, the engineering team explains, explains the same term quite differently and to different people and construed quite the opposite by customer success and ops team. Here is a person who's actually heard and seen this. <laughs> quite commonly seen, especially in product and feature uh, packed solution, comp solution companies for a solution. I don't know if I read that out too well, but you know you know the drift of this. Yeah, yeah I got the drift. I think you gotta keep it simple. Most things in businesses are simple, right? Machine learning, AI, um, deep learning, all of that is about mimicking the behavior from the past. You're only as good as your data from the past, right? Correct. And so businesses, companies that have great data sets and are able to analyze, you know, behavior, interactions uh, based on historics, historical data are the ones that have the best ML propensity. So don't get confused. It is the next iteration of BI. It is, right? It is the next iteration of BI, which uses elements that are not necessarily just structured fields. And I do think that, you know, the ability to use, you know, uh, artificial intelligence is, is going to just become part and parcel of every business. And so don't get, don't be fearful of it. Just understand and look at you know, the areas in your business that you can use where you have strong data sets to understand a behavior outside of what you can understand from just rows and columns in a, in a database field, right? And so <laughs> the way I'll put it is uh, when someone asks you that, it's like, hey, what's the behavior change? What is the difference that, what, what, can, what can you predict based on the past is the only question, right? And if there is a prediction that was, you know, that you could, in, a lot of those insights are already there, a lot of the insights are already known, right? So it's just now saying, hey, can we use it at scale? Can we use it at scale in, you know, in, in online businesses? That's where you'll start seeing the real value of some of those things come along. But if you ask me, don't, don't get confused by, by all of these buzzwords. It is, it is really about mimicking his historic behavior and just making sure that you know, once you do that, how does how do you make predictions? How do you make recommendations? And in every product, every service, you're going to see some instances of that because uh, it is going to be the core of where the future is at. Yeah, yeah, with so much data being collected as well. Yes. Yeah. Now, now to the last part, which I you know which I want to talk to you about is you know you you're a part of Thai in Seattle and also the Washington what is it WTIA, right? Mm -hmm. So. What's your message? And you've gone through a startup as well. What's your message to founders of startup? Okay, because at least the startup companies I work with, the, the customer centricity is not as strong because they are leaning towards growth and you know hitting the milestone to raise the next series of you know uh, round of money. Given all that, what would be your advice to such founders? <clears throat> So again, early with founders and, and startups, I think we ought to understand that 
you know, the genesis of an idea and a product changes over time, right? Mm -hmm. And so for most, most startups that I have worked with, I advise, essentially they go through this metamorphosis of some kind where <clears throat> the first cohort of customers don't end up necessarily being the core customer set because the product is evolving, right? But the ability to be in front of a customer and really understand and, and be able to say, this feature is core, this feature is not core, and do I build this for this customer or do I have the discipline of saying no, right? Mm. Because I want to build a product at scale. If you're building a SaaS business, is where sure. like, you know, a lot of startups say they succeed or fail. And usually they're driven by one large customer, right? Who basically has all the, all the control in that relationship, telling the, telling the startup founder or the product team that built this thing, right? And so my, my ask would be is like to start looking at this and saying, get closer to the customer, uh, you know, everything from the acquisition to the usage part, because in the acquisition, you understand the need and, you know, what works in terms of like, is this what the customer is looking for? And then there's complete reality when a purchase, you know, it's a software because customers are asking for something completely different, saying like, hey, I asked you for this, but the reality is I want this, 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 and that, right? And so founders need to be very close to the customer. And in order to be close to the customer and then being able to discern what is the core of what they look for, because every piece of software, there's only 15% of it that customers really, really use, right? And then there are there are 95% edge cases that you will see in this, especially in the startup world, because people are wanting to try and, you know, make the software work best for their use case, right? And so I would say that the customer is the heart and be very, very involved in the acquisition, be very involved in the usage, be involved in, in the changes of that customers are going through when they're abusing your software and what they are asking for to understand why are they asking this question? Is this something that everybody else needs or is this something that only one customer needs? And that's what, that's what will make the difference between a scalable product that you build uh, you know, from, from that perspective. And then after that, it's about relationship because you know, a lot of customers buy the product from, from a company is because of the founder. It's the passion of the founder. They like the, they want someone to succeed. They, they can connect with this person and they say, I wanna do business with you. And so if you lose that touch, I think you lose your touch with your business where your business evolves, but then you've lost the, lost the touch with the customer to understand, uh, you know, what, you know, what, how to evolve your product in the future, right? Because that's one thing I would say, you know, staying in, staying to the core foundation of, you know, spending X percentage of your time, whether you're a founder, whether you're a CEO of a large company mid-size, so that spending X percentage of your time with your customer is the core of your success. That is, who, that is who pays your bills. That is how you learn how your product or service is being used. Wow, that's, that's fantastic advice because I can, I can see that it's very easy for founders to get, you know, as you said, one powerful customer can take you along in a, yeah. in a direction where you, you know, later on find hard mm -hmm. to recover. Yeah. Well, uh, Paddy, it's uh, 8.28 PM over here. Uh, it's been, and we've answered all questions which have come up from the audience as well. It's been absolutely fantastic, Paddy. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, thank you for all the insights. This was an amazing conversation, actually. I, I, was, I was just wondering for a while, will I be able to actually fill in one hour of questioning you know, on the role of a CCO? And guess what? We may probably go on for another hour if, you know, if, we, if we are given the choice, I guess. <laughs> Anita, thank you. Thank you, MD. You know, as always, it's been a pleasure. And I look forward to you know, engaging with, uh, with you more on on on, on sessions sure, like and, this, and uh, and, and I'd like to thank Freshworks as well. You know who have partnered with uh, with CCUF uh, for this uh, for this event. Thank you. With that, uh, let me hand back to uh, Vignesh. Yes. So uh, thank you so much, Fadi and MD. That was uh, very engrossing for the past one hour and uh, highly insightful, highly real. Uh, I'm sure the attendees would uh, agree with me. This is almost like eavesdropping on a conversation between two industry veterans and it couldn't have been better. So this is my first CCFO, I mean, OF uh, event and uh, I'm glad it turned out to be a great one. Uh, really looking forward to the next uh, event. A quick note to the audience, the next CCOF event will be on the Thursday, uh, the 29th of uh, July at uh, 7.30 p.m. sharp. Thank you so much once again 
uh, for joining us uh, today. Thank you. Lovely. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye. Good night and stay safe. Bye.